Hi, folks. I'm Oliver Libby. I'm the host of The Owl Factor and co-founder of HL Ventures and the Resolution Project. On The Owl Factor, as many of you know, we feature meaningful conversations with true leaders and luminaries talking about the vital nexus between leadership and trust. The intimate relationship between these traits that power the human experience is worthy of deep understanding. Each of our episodes features a different leadership precept or concept, and what we're focusing on today is the idea that we meet adversity with calm, positivity, and resourcefulness, and we exhaust all alternatives. One of my favorite quotes is, it'll be okay in the end, and if it's not okay, it's just not the end yet. So with that in mind, let me welcome our amazing guest for today, Jacqueline Novogratz. Jacqueline is the founder and CEO of Acumen. Her work began in 1986 when she quit her job on Wall Street to co-found Rwanda's first microfinance institution. That experience inspired her to write the bestseller, The Blue Sweater, Bridging the Gap Between the Rich and Poor, and indeed to create Acumen, a true entrepreneur. Indeed, when she founded Acumen in 2001, few had heard the words impact investing before. But 20 years later, under Jacqueline's leadership, Acumen has invested 135 million or more to build more than 136 social enterprises all around the world in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the United States, and more. These companies have leveraged more than $746 million in additional financing and brought basic services like affordable education, healthcare, clean water, energy and sanitation to more than 308 million people. Just think about the leverage of that incredible model. So of course, Jacqueline serves on incredibly impressive boards and speaks all around the world. And in 2017, understandably, Forbes listed Jacqueline as one of the world's 100 greatest living business minds. And we have the immense privilege of access to that mind and that incredible well of experience today. Having built the Resolution Project myself with Acumen as one of our guiding lights, I can personally confirm how incredibly impressive Jacqueline is and yet also how welcoming and friendly and supportive she has always been to her colleagues in the social sector. So with that, Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. And I wanna start by asking you, how, how are things today? How are you? Well, Oliver, after that introduction, um, I'm a little overwhelmed. Thank you very much. and. Um, and I'm better for having seen you. Uh, it's been a long time since we actually got to walk around New York City together. And, um, and you've done amazing things, um, as have all your fellows in Resolution Project. So I'm good. Well, th thank you. That's too kind as always. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I wanted to start with that. I, I remember walking around downtown Manhattan with you just scant weeks before COVID-19 washed over New York City. Um, and at the time, as I recall, we were talking a lot about the launch of your book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, which is, by the way, for all those listening, uh, something you should pick up, folks. It's amazing. And in it, I was struck by well, a number of things we'll talk about today. But, but one of the quotes that stayed with me was, when we dare to understand the other, we find the seeds of our best selves. And it strikes me, Jacqueline, that this is a key way to build trust with one another, to understand, to listen. How does that concept feature in your leadership philosophy and empower you to do the things you have accomplished? Thanks, um, Oliver. Yeah, it, it actually is also the seed of what I would call the moral imagination. Um, and if you want to change systems that by definition don't want changing, they, that is the status quo. Moral imagination as a leadership concept is, is absolutely critical. It starts with empathy putting yourself in another person's shoes, which is the question you're asking, that only when we really understand the people we are, are trying to serve, can we actually be effective in serving them. But it can't end with empathy. It has to move from empathy to what I would call immersion, spend time, get close, understand the problem from the perspective of those who are living it. Then, analyzing the system around it, then move to action. So the, the listening and trying to see yourself in another, in with that level of empathy and moral imagination requires also seeing a level of wholeness of a, another's humanity, which then hopefully ricochets back to yourself because sometimes we don't recognize that wholeness in ourselves either. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder, just because it's such a fascinating concept uh, that you shared, can you talk a little bit about what moral imagination is for our audience? Yeah, as I was saying, the moral imagination you know, that starts with the empathy is essentially having the humility to see the world as it is. So that empathy is not just 
sympathy. It's not feel good. It's the recognition of what the problem is. So if you want to solve the problem of electricity and we still have 800 million people on the planet who have no access to electricity, it's not so simple as saying, I feel sorry for those people and I have a light, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it to them, give it all away. Moral imagination goes much deeper. It starts with the humility of trying to understand the problem from the perspective of those people who do not have electricity. And it doesn't stop there. Coupled with that, held in tension uh, with, with that humility is the audacity to imagine what it could be. What will it take to get electricity to the 800 million people still without it? Um, and so it's both, Oliver. It's, it's, it's holding humility and audacity as two equal and critical values in tension. The moral imagination is required for both. It, it sure is. A, a lot of the folks who tune in to the Owl Factor are entrepreneurs and in fact, social entrepreneurs. Uh, and one of the things that I think sometimes worries social entrepreneurs is the idea that you may come from a place and an experience that's very different from uh, the communities that you're working with. And, and, and how do you bridge the gap and make that okay? And, and in fact, you know, bind together the ties of trust that make action in those communities more successful. And so, I mean, I think that's a lot of what and you're I would talking say the about. Best, the best entrepreneurs, the best social entrepreneurs um, who can be from anywhere are those who actually come in, not thinking that they have all the answers, but they start by listening, by demonstrating the kind of respect that 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 requires listening, not just with your ears, but with all parts of yourself. So even if someone who's never been asked questions by someone who wanted to hear the answers suddenly knows, and it is a level of knowingness that that person who's asking the question really wants their answer, the whole conversation changes. You still may fail, but you will start to build a level of trust because you start with curiosity, you start with inquiry, you start by being willing to change your assumptions and move from there and people feel it. That's so inherent in the moral imagination and from a social entrepreneur's perspective. Um, it also allows us to get away from our own sense of, um, our own, we stop ourselves so often because we think, I, I, I shouldn't do this, it's not my problem. Well, frankly, these are shared problems, but the, the, the question is how do we approach solving those problems from a place that recognizing that recognizes that our, 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 our destiny and our dignity are mutually enabled. It, absolutely. It, you know, the, the concept of immersion that you just shared there too is, is, is critically important. I find a lot of times that entrepreneurs have a concept because, you know, they thought of an idea and it's a little bit the difference between understanding that you can have, you know, the, the structure of your idea, but it has to be altered by your contact with reality and by the people who you're actually working to help. Exactly. Early days at Acumen, Oliver, when we were investing in, in safe drinking water, I can't tell you how many engineers, PhDs from the best universities in the world, really well intended, would come to us and say, here's my water filter and can you help us get it to low income people? And I would say, well, how much time have you spent hmm. uh, with them? Do they like the taste of the water that you're filtering? Can they get it very easily? Can they afford it? And they'd be like, that's not my consideration. I have the technology <laughs> and I'd say, good luck to you, buddy. <laughs> show me and indeed even with one of our companies who's where who, which had a fantastic entrepreneur who knew the community he underestimated um how much the taste of the water mattered he thought if he got people uh pure drinking water fully fil filtrated uh that people wouldn't get sick they would love it and two things happened number one the water tasted too pure and so he needed to add a reverse osmosis filter so that it sweetened the taste of the water. Then he could um, see people using it. And two, that people had a hierarchy 
where water came from God, God would decide whether you were sick or not. On the other hand, if you got water for your chickens and they got healthier, you would bring income back to the family and understanding that that's what I'm talking about, the moral imagination, going in, changing assumptions, listening, building trust, right. and uh, ultimately building a business that, that can help solve a big problem. Yeah, I mean, you're touching on something I, I wanted to actually talk about here, which is, and, and I think you actually, you might have even tweeted about this early last year in terms of the fact that we seem to have lost trust in institutions. And uh, and I think a lot about this because my whole family are scientists and doctors, and, and we seem to be having uh, some challenges building trust with expertise institutions, be they government or universities or whatever. But, you know, there's certainly translational issues between those communities and those who need help. And I think in that tweet, you introduced the concept of Ubuntu. Uh, I am because you are, which is something a lot of our resolution fellows taught me over the years. Actually, I had never heard of this before uh, working with young entrepreneurs in Africa. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to how the concept of Ubuntu can help us restore trust between people and institutions and each other. That's such a great question. Um, as you said, we've lost trust in all of our big institutions and many of our smaller ones we no longer even have a consensus on what truth is. And yet we can tell if someone is telling a truth in a, in a deep way when we're encountering them. Ubuntu, this idea that I am because you are, has again at the at fundamental, that moral imagination, that I see you as neither above nor below me, but as part of me. That's at the heart of Ubuntu. I think then, how do you practice it? How do you practice it? You practice it by showing up, by listening first, which does not mean to stop yourself from offering solutions, but they are thoughtful solutions built collaboratively, if you will, and um, by admitting mistakes and failures, by showing up again. And over time, in that recognition that trust is the most precious and increasingly rarest currency that we have and recognizing that at the end of the day, all we really have is our reputation, especially in an interdependent world. Um, building from that perspective, I think about some of the places you and I have both been doing this work about the same amount of time. And I think of countries, nations like Pakistan, where as a white woman, um, I could easily, and I am sure, was mistrusted uh, not only 20 years ago, but in times when relations between the United States and Pakistan were very hot. And yet showing up, admitting mistakes, not bragging about what we had done until we had actually done something, working closely with the, the locals whose problems these were and recognizing that I needed to not only serve, but I had to make these problems with my, my own without solving those problems. And um, because people have to solve the problems themselves. The level of trust meant that I am because you are, and I am changed because of my interaction with you. And it's those again are those seeds of, of mutual transformation that I am not here to help you and walk away. I am here to offer what I can and to be changed by you as I hope these interactions will influence who you are too. Yeah, undoubtedly. And, and interestingly enough, we, we have an upcoming owl factor all about the concept within leadership and trust of lifetime to make a reputation minute to lose it. So I just- Especially now. That. Yeah, oh my gosh, yes, 100%. Uh, and, uh, and and I think, by the way, you know, we are in an era where elegant subtlety is uh, is maybe a little passe, and people are out there talking about everything they're going to do. And this, it's refreshing to hear you talk about, you know, building up that uh, corpus of accomplishments before going out there and then touting a, an approach. Uh, it's hugely important. When I first got to the, the country, actually, and... Uh, I didn't know anybody. The, the, the first person I met was a, a man who's now 92, Barbarelli. And um, Said Barbarelli said to me, we see people like you come and go all the time. 
And so here's my advice to you. I welcome you and I'm so happy that you're coming, but keep your head down, do the work. And only when you've actually made a contribution, talk about it. And uh, I thank him all the time for it. No, it's He's still right our father. No, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and mentors like that with good advice are an immense blessing. You know, I, I wanted to, before we move on from this, this, I think, really important topic, uh, an area that, that I, I quickly name checked earlier is, is particularly the relationship between people and quote unquote experts. And th this is a fraught topic because expertise comes in many flavors and there's all sorts of ramifications to how expertise is conveyed or conferred upon people. But generally speaking, it does seem like, you know, we have the juxtaposition of people who have an opinion and people who know a lot of things uh, constantly these days. And I'm curious as to how, for example, in Acumen, you have so many great experts and advisors who have this great knowledge. How do we re -sew the layers of trust that I think are kind of the basic ingredients of society, right? Yeah, if I if I understand you correctly, um, because it's a, it, language is so tricky and words are so tricky. When I was working in the development sector in the 1980s, we had the development experts, and I found that them to often be the opposite of seekers. I found them often to come um, into a place with a great deal of certainty and the solutions, and then not take enough accountability when those solutions failed because they may have been a perfect solution where the expert had come prior and that no longer worked in the local context. So there's that kind of expert. But what I think you're saying is that there are also, also then those people who have done the work, who actually have a deep understanding of a particular issue or place or um, disease or situation and um, rather than write them off because my opinion is more important than your knowledge, how do we actually bring them into the, into the conversation? Chinua Achebe has what I actually find might even be probably more confusing, but also a different light on this. He talks about genuine elites and counterfeit elites. And for me, that's even a, a more powerful juxtaposition, helpful for me in the way that we help develop leaders as you help as you help develop leaders. Um, great Nigerian writer, scholar, wrote that you know, in Nigeria, he said, this is in the 90s, we have these counterfeit elites that have these very big jobs because of who their parents were, the money that they had inherited often, not always from the, the most legitimate means. And they hadn't done the work. And what we need are genuine elites people who have done the work, who just like great athletes, the Navy SEALs, that those individuals who have done the work and have something to offer, we've got to get better at a society, as a society at celebrating the genuine elites and recognizing that those bloviating heads with titles who haven't done the work are not actually the ones we should be celebrating. And so I think it's also to all of us and to media to redefine success, to recognize that we need science. We need engineers who know how to build a bridge. We need those fundamentals and they should be married with a deep recognition of what it will take to solve a problem in a way that includes the poor, the overlooked, the underestimated. And that's the magic skill set. Yeah. And actually, to be honest with you, right at the beginning of, of your answer just now, you talked about the idea of approaching things with humility and taking accountability when you're when you're wrong. And actually, in my experience, the genuine elites do a better job of doing that. Even my, you know, my friends who are Navy SEALs are never the most loud or the most built. Um, they're just incredibly competent and they exude this quiet sense of, you know, I know what I'm up to here. And I think those are two things that people could really uh, take to heart, uh, you know, humility and accountability, even, even with expertise. Um, Actually, it's often, as you said, the most accomplished, learned people, particularly the builders, people who've built something, 
you cannot build something without failure. You cannot build something without disappointment and setback. And so by the time you actually built it, I, I hope you feel a sense of pride in what you've built and a real sense of humility, one, that you couldn't build it by yourself. And two, that um, looking back, uh, every, every road was not a pretty one necessarily. No, no, no. I mean, and this is a perfect transition to another concept I wanted to touch on. Although you reminded me, my grandfather was my great kind of Yoda figure. And he always used to say, true leaders find themselves on a spectrum between confidence and humility. Uh, you have to have confidence that you can do the things you're setting out to do. And it's okay to be confident. But if that's not married with, I got help along the way, and I got lucky, and a lot of things went my way in order to enable that, then you're not a true leader. So just, you're, you raise that quote in my mind, uh, with what you just said. Um, yeah, um, you know, interesting that you should mention uh, Chinua Achebe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the things fall apart. Yes. Uh, right, yeah, and, and you know, my goodness, does it feel like the center cannot hold right now uh, on a whole number of levels and the stress of just consuming media, uh, running organizations, uh, you know, is really, uh, really tough and requires some resilience. You know, I, I mentioned this at the very beginning of, of our episode here, one of my favorite quotes, simplistic though it may be, is uh, is things will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's just not the end yet. And I'm curious because you, you had this really meaningful quote in your book um, that uh, I remember it was something about uh, no one escapes life without broken parts. So we've been talking, you know, in all this about resilience, about how, you know, you have to be able to go through the difficult times. And so I'm curious, you know, what, what are lessons that you have learned for, in your experience and from your entrepreneurs about resilience and particularly how laying the groundwork with trust, communities, team members, et cetera, can prepare you better in terms of resilience? Well, I mean, Oliver, I would also turn the question back on to you as well, because both of us make a living out of identifying and investing in those entrepreneurs. And um, what I've seen now, and we have between a thousand, you know, a thousand fellows and 150 com companies across all of our different funds now, there is no predictor of success like resilience and determination. Because the, particularly those social entrepreneurs that are trying to solve these big, hard systems. Um, and why community? And why trust as part of building your resilience is, uh, is that we need each other. We can't do this alone. I have very stark examples of kind of mic drop examples of where I've seen extraordinary resilience come from very unexpected places. And you, as you know, I had experience building a microfinance bank in Rwanda prior to the genocide. And then I went back right after and have been working in and out since. And um, I remember one woman who worked with a group of widows after the genocide. Now, most of these women, many of these women had been raped and were pregnant from their attackers and were just fully distraught, as you can imagine, coming out of this incredible situation. And, um, and this woman was fierce. She did everything to build this incredible institution for all of these other women. And then her husband got killed and she became a widow. And she said to me, I don't know if I would have made it, but suddenly the community that I had been there to accompany and to help held me. And at first it was so frightening for me. And the more I could let that be, the more I realized that this was the gift. It was in that mutuality. When we are building these companies, organizations, institutions, I hope we don't have situations that are that dramatic. But just this morning, um, Oliver, I was with my team and saying, here we are in the office two years later, not because just, just because of ourselves, but because in community, we accompanied each other through and now, as we continue to face uncertainty in a world, we have to lead with that collective sense of resilience, not just individual resilience. And if you are a company or a nation or a family, we have to build institutions that are strong enough and resilient enough to withstand those times in an individual's lives where getting out of 
fed may in and of itself be an act of courage, but that the institution, the family, the nation can hold them. And I think that that is one of the big challenges of our time. And it means that we as leaders need to cultivate in ourselves those mechanisms that allow us to what I call embrace the beautiful struggle. And the more you can do that as a leader, the more you are able to help other people find the resilience in themselves. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I agree with you, by the way, like if you not in a particularly mercenary way, but if you make building trust, transparency and the ties that bind with your community, your team, your beneficiaries, your colleagues, uh, a core part of what you do every day, then when times get rough, there, that's there as a store of, uh, you know, it's almost in, in so far as that you don't build trust just because of the bad days, but when you're in a bad day, you better hope that you have the trust of your community and your team. I think that's a critically important. That's right. Or the community that you are there to serve when a company goes bust or you find corruption and you're the one that is on the front line, you want to have allies in the other country that know who you are and what you stand for. And that comes from showing up over and over, always being honest, having the, the most integrity, calling them first to tell them what is happening because you trust and respect that relationship. Um, all of those different pieces are so critical uh, to building trust. The final piece I would add on that, which I think is part of resilience and trust, that it took me a long time to learn. So for the younger social entrepreneurs is the um, knowing when and how to show vulnerability. Because when you are a social entrepreneur and I, I, we've watched each other grow in these ways, it's a mistake to think you have to have all the answers. There are days where you have to have the strength to keep believing that it ain't over till it's over to your point um, and to help cheerlead people to get there. And then there are days when you have to recognize that you cannot get the ship moving by yourself. And the biggest gift you can give is to let your team know that, to let your team know that you know what's going on and it, it's not pretty and that you need to ask the team to hold the problems with you in very real ways. And the first time I did that when Acumen was, was young and fragile, I found it really difficult. I didn't know if I would lose the respect of the team. And of course the opposite happened. The team felt seen, the team felt included, the team felt more trusting and, um, and we went through because of them, not me. But it took me to redefine my own success, my own identity in terms of someone who could finally recognize that in that vulnerability and in that imperfection was strength and its own kind of perfection if we all held it. Well, incredibly wise words and, and moving at that. I, I wanted to, and I, we're coming to a close uh, only uh, because I want to be respectful of your time because I could talk to you for hours more. Uh, I've about 12 minutes. <laughs> um, but I you know, wanted to ask you two, two questions that we always end on. Uh, one, and, and you've shared some already, but are there two or three leadership principles that have guided you that you want to kind of leave our audience with as they think about building their organizations and, and their dreams? Well, I won't, I won't spend much time on moral imagination, but the, the building of Acumen has very much been based in this idea of the moral imagination. I would say two, which is particularly important in this time because our systems are broken, because we've lost trust in so many of our institutions and so many of our leaders, because we know we have to reimagine capitalism, democracy, and the way that our political systems work, healthcare. Actually, Oliver, we can't think of any industries that don't need that reimagining. Because of that, and because underneath that is the recognition that our old systems that put shareholders in the center uh, no longer work for us, not in an interdependent world. We have to imagine new systems, but we don't have a roadmap for doing it. When I was growing up, it was real simple. 
here's the roadmap. You're in the nonprofit sector and you want to do good for the world, or you're in the for-profit sector and you want to maximize shareholder returns. One of the fundamental leadership principles for someone or some team that wants to shift a system is to have the courage to hold values in tension. We've been talking about some of them, humility and audacity. I would say generosity and accountability. Um, recognizing that we have to often navigate the gray that there are no perfect solutions because we have to hold the efficiency of making something work and the profits that are needed for financial sustainability and the inclusion of enabling those people who've been overlooked to be part of the solution. Um, it's hard to do. We also have to do it in a way that helps us have conversations across lines of difference in a world where people are having a hard time talking to each other. So number two, holding tensions. Um, combined with the moral imagination, I believe that allows us to have a more ample, um, fulsome, not just conversation, but system development that allows more people to solve their own problems. And the third that I would say, which I feel we've already talked about is embrace the beautiful struggle. That this work is hard. My father would say it's not for sissies um, because you fall down a lot because you go into it thinking, I'll start this organization and I'll solve that problem in three years. And 30 years later, you might still be working on that problem. But the, the resilience and the determination to stick with it, to fail and know that without failure, you will not succeed. To have the courage to get up again and try, learn, fail, repeat, that's how we see change. And, um, and so those three, moral imagination, hold values and tension, embrace the beautiful struggle. Amazing. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I know this last question is something that will resonate with you. You wrote that cynics don't build the future, and I agree. Um, and so we always end the owl factor on a positive note or a note of hope at the very least. And so is there something that you find motivates you, inspires you, and gives you hope that we can leave our audience with today? Well, only because now I'm, you know, I've been doing this for so long and I'm one of the, you know, um, older, which is shocking when you look and think, how did that happen? The good news of 35 years of doing this work is that I know that change is possible. I just got an email this morning uh, from a, a, a major donor um, who gave us a, a million dollars in, in 2006 um, to, to help us start an energy portfolio to bring light and electricity to the poor um, when the when 1.5 billion people had no access to electricity. This is pre-solar. Um, people weren't thinking about energy, weren't really working in it. And quite frankly, when we first started the conversation, because I'm a believer that you shouldn't be driven by your donors, you need to be driven by the problems that you're solving. I pushed back. And so she, who was just extraordinary, kept sending me um, information. Here's what's happening. This is nascent. There is work being done. And so, um, we ultimately started an energy portfolio. And in 2007, we made our first $250,000 investment in two guys with a solar lantern, a lot of humility because they had to listen to people who nobody thought of as customers. And yet they were using kerosene, uh, they were paying for it. And, um, and I sent her an email last night to talk about this big project that we're now doing. And in it were the, the real stats that today Acumen's for-profit and nonprofit funds have brought light and electricity um, cleanly, affordably to 160 million low-income people, which represent 30% of all people in the world who today have off-grid light, solar light and electricity. We have a sight line now to what it will take to bring light and electricity to the 800 million people who still don't have it. And she wrote back and said, well, that was the best million dollar grant I have ever made in my life. And, uh, and sure, 
it's been 15 years, almost 16. We've had failures. But when I think back to where the world was, and I see where the world is, and I think about the different characters who all played a part in making it happen, I can only conclude that one, change is possible, and two, it is only possible when people who believe that it is only to us to create the world we dare to imagine that it actually changes. Those are the people I want to know, I want to be with, I want to spend my life with, and who give me hope 100 times a day. Well, I love that story. It, it reminds me sometimes that while things may take longer to do than we expected, that things can get done and uh, and great things and things that help a lot of people. Uh, and that's something we should all keep in mind uh, because it's still the blink of an eye in the human experience and in history. So it's incredible work, it's incredible work. Well, Jacqueline, thank you. I, I am so grateful to you for sharing these insights. I hope that everyone in our audience is following your advice and listening and understanding uh, you because you have certainly come by it honestly. You've done some incredible work. So it's an honor to have you here on The All Factor. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who was listening today. And, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The All Factor. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. And Oliver, thank you for all the work you do and how, for all the passion and the goodness that you put into the world. That gives me hope too. Thank you.